Yeah. And um, if there is anybody here for the first time, I would also like to welcome them. Uh, welcome to today's class. We will have a 40 minute session at this point of time. We will continue it next week, though I will not be here, but I will still be taking the class. Um, so I request you all to <clears throat> stay tuned. And uh, if there's anybody new, I want to welcome you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for coming. May the Lord bless you. We do have the recording of this session. Uh, last session, last week, so the last, last weeks, I don't know whether I have it, but this, uh, we will have the recording. If anyone, if you want to share it or want to um, uh, listen to this again, please feel free to, uh, you know, ask our media team, um, or dear Pramod or even dear Rajesh, or even uh, you can ask them, they'll be happy to uh, share this thing with you. All right. So let's start. I want to recap with what we have done already, and uh, from there we will we will we will go. Okay, and let me just. Okay, so the theme, the title is "Know Your Bible." Yeah, and um, the Bible is the Word of God, and we saw last last uh, last time when we were looking at the Bible, we saw about different things, and I just want to you know. Recap for those who uh, were not there or those who were the uh, those who are new. Okay, Bible was the first ever printed book in the history by the Gutenberg Press in fourteen hundred and fifty-five um, A.D. All right, the word Bible comes from the Greek word Biblia, which just simply means books. There is nothing spiritual to that word. Uh, um, and um, so one second, let me just fix this up. Okay. Um, um, so there is nothing spiritual to that word. It just simply means books. So our Bible is also called a book. That is the Bible is a collection of books. Okay. Which just means books. All right. It was written by around 40 authors living in three continents all different from different backgrounds, different tradition, different languages. They came, uh, they wrote their books, never knowing that their books would be preserved as scripture for the entire generations. They never knew though, those things. Okay, when Paul is writing, he never knew that those scriptures, those words will be used as a New Testament in after 2000 years. They never knew those things. But they wrote what was true and they wrote um, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It was written by over like 1,400 years, okay? And Old Testament was in the language of Hebrew uh, with some Aramaic. New Testament was in the dialect of Greek. Later, the Christian churches of the first and second centuries acknowledged the four gospels and the range of apostolic letters and uh, uh, written in Greek as the word of God alongside the Hebrew scripture. And the most famous English translation is the authorized version, which is 611 printed King James version of the of the Bible. Okay, um, the Bible is a collection of 66 books. Old Testament 39, New Testament is 27. Uh, we will also see about how uh, these things are, uh, how the Roman Catholic Bible has more books and why it is so. Okay, so this is the classification of the. Hebrew, as I told you last time, the Hebrew scriptures have only, the Old Testament have only 24 books compared to our uh, English Bible having 39 books. Um, it is. It doesn't uh, mean that, you know, English Bible have a lot of additional books. It simply means uh, the, it differs just with the way the classification of the book has been done. Okay, simple example is we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy as five books, but in the um, uh, in the, it is known as Torah and it is still five books and then this is called as the major prophets and their books are all separate okay one two three four five six Joshua Judges Samuel Kings Isaiah and then this minor prophets are under one heading that is called as the 12 okay that says one book one continuous book from Hosea to Malachi and then we have the Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentation, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, 
and last is Ezra and Nehemiah as one book. So altogether, when we count in the Hebrew way, we have 24. But when we individually count those books, it is it will come around 39 books of the Bible. So the first, the, the, the Old Testament is divided into three. Torah, which is known as, which is Hebrew word for teachings. So that's the first five books of the, of the Bible. Then the Nevim, that is the prophets, which includes both the major prophets and the minor prophets. Okay, the 12 minor prophets. And these are the major prophets, which uh, they see. And then the Ketuvims are the writings. Okay, uh, they are known as the scrolls starting from Psalms, Proverbs, Job, and all those uh, books mentioned in the uh, in the writing. Now, surprisingly, even Daniel is known as is not not is not known as a prophetic book. Daniel is known as writings. Okay, it is known as writings. All right, God inspired the whole Bible. That's what it says, Second Timothy three verse sixteen. That means. This word of God was not handed down from heaven. This was not like, you know, some angels gave, came and gave us and said, this is it, the ultimate, please follow this. This was not, uh, this was not something which was um, like, you know, somebody in the ecstatic realm, they didn't know what was happening and they wrote in the, in, in the realm of you know supernatural no there is nothing of those to, those things bible is simply known as inspired word of god that means the holy spirit was behind the the writing of every single word in the bible because holy spirit is the author it can never go wrong okay that's the reason why we believe that the bible is uh, true and um, it has been speaking to us even today all right. These authors were moved by God to write the word of, God, of the Lord. Okay. It was moved by God himself. Uh, so it, that's what it is written that, you know, God moved the authors. Okay. They, they, in the inspiration, they wrote the scripture and the Holy Spirit guided them, preserved those writings even today. As Bible was translated into common language, that was carried it by 200 all right thank you by 280 the bible was translated into seven languages by 580 it was translated into 13 languages by 980 it was translated into 17 languages by 1480, it was translated into 28 languages. By 1880, it was translated into 57 languages. By 1980, it was translated into 537 languages. By 1980, the Bible was translated around 1,100 languages. By 2006, almost 2,426 languages have some portions of the Bible. Uh, you, as I told you last time, you may still think by all the languages of the Bible. That's a surprising figure that still 2,000 people groups don't have Bible yet. That means at least a New Testament, they don't have. How many people groups? 2,000 people. So you need to pray for the, you know, that these 2,000 people groups will get the Bible in their own languages. Why should we study the Bible? To know God, to enjoy and to love God, to teach in all righteousness, to teach us, yeah, to teach us what is right, and to know the will of God, to find comfort and strength, and to expose us of our sin. All right. So that's what we saw it from the last study. Well, so today we will see about how this um, web, how this Bible was organized and preserved and presented as we have it today. Let me also tell you in the very outset, this may surprise many of you. This may be a shocking figure for most of you, but none of the original documents have survived to date. Okay, that means 
of a bible if you if somebody comes and ask you where is the original documents of the bible preserved it has not been uh because during the time of the invasion of babylonia they burned the entire place and it was damaged the new testament was written but it was also damaged during the time of nero and he burned the entire thing again so none of the original documents have survived till date okay but the bible that we use today is well attested by many ancient copies so today we will see how can this bible be true without this original documents okay how can we say that you know this bible was actually copied in a right way so we will see that today we do have some old copies of the portion of the bible some of those are actually very close in date to the originals all right so that means though we don't have the original documents but the copies still exist and these copies were copied by different people from different continents from different people groups in a very meticulous way and they have survived okay so this we will see today and you'll be surprised to know many of this fact the oldest form of the bible that has ever been discovered is over 2600 years old you know what is that is the blessing of numbers the lord bless you the lord keep you the lord make his face shine upon you and the lord make his countenance fall on you so this this portion of numbers was written on silver leaves it was discovered in 1979 ad near jerusalem you want to see the picture of that well yeah i'll show you the picture this is the picture do you understand do you see this silver lining this is the two thin silver rolls which contains the priestly blessing from number 624 to 26 dated 7th century bc the time of the prophet jeremiah they were discovered in an ex excavation of the burial tomb near jerusalem in 1979 so this is this is the oldest manuscript this is not the original text this is the oldest manuscripts of the priestly blessing that we have all right you know how many dates older 2600 older years older okay so the oldest form bible is that one okay it is 2600 year old now the new testament the oldest portion of the new testament has been discovered is a papyrus fragment we will see what is papyrus by the way of john's gospel found in the sands of egypt okay this fragment of john's gospel this uh, manuscripts or the copy was copied 30 years after john wrote the original draft okay that means john wrote close to ad 70 to 90 so between that time when john wrote it so by ad 100 this copy was found okay so that's the oldest new testament copy that we have i will show you that the picture of that also um okay one second this is the one this is the portion of the john's gospel i hope you are able to see this especially for those who are traveling you know please uh, see this because this pictures means a lot this is a portion of the john's gospel 1831 to 33 37 to 38 that dates about ad 125 it is often referred to as ryland's fragment since it is housed in the john ryland library in manchester england that's the reason why it is named as ryland's fragment okay it was discovered in egypt in 1920 ad that old is this um you know how many years old this is like close to 2000 years old stuff all right this is the portion of john's gospel in and that's a verse which is mentioned here so 
what do we understand by this that's the original the oldest portion not the original this is also a manuscript by the way all right most of the ancient copies of the bible were written on papyrus or vellum okay this was written on papyrus or vellum ha uh, so what is papyrus or what is vellum papyrus was a reed found near the nile river it was a plant something like plant which was um, uh, you know which was uh, papyrus was a reed that grew in the nile river of egypt that could be dried fashioned into a type of paper what was vellum it was specially prepared skin from the animal such as cow or goat okay this was a durable material and sometimes it can be erased and reused so coming back to what is papyrus the new testament and it was written by in the bible it was written in these two forms throughout it was preserved okay now you know do you know how many copies of new testament have been found till date we have 23769 known copies of the just the new testament just the new testament okay and how did this figure come in how many copies in latin we have almost like 10000 copies in latin just the new testament okay greek we have 5795 copies slavic 4000 copies these are all ancient languages okay armenian close to 2000 copies coptic 975 copies Ethiopian six hundred copies, Syriac three fifty copies, G um, you know Georgian forty three copies, Gothic close to six copies. So when you add all this thing, it comes around twenty three thousand seven hundred sixty nine known copies of the. See, in all these different languages, the New Testament was written, and when they compared those languages together, they found out that it was ninety nine percentage. similar there was no differential all of them wrote the same thing all right let's move ahead as i told you this was the oldest known old testament portion of the hebrew bible okay this i know you will uh, this was written in like silver ro rolls on a stone it was written and uh, after much um what is a research and all they found out this was the uh, priestly blessing okay now this is the manuscripts okay so you will be surprised one of the two oldest complete manuscript of the new testament this is how the new testament this is a greek language by the way this is how it was this is not printed okay this is not a printed version of this is a handwritten a uh, manuscript complete manuscript of the new testament this is what how it was this is a leaf from codex sinaiticus the manuscript dates back to 4th century ad and contains the greek old testament okay this is a leaf where it was found around 4th century ad with the greek old testament verses all right this i have already showed to you about the john's gospel that dates about ad 125 this is uh, called as ryland fragment these are all preserved by the way these are all preserved in england in the library some of those are preserved in uh, russia in the russian library so you know so these are all these are all manuscripts so but we don't have a original thing but we don't need to because uh, i will come back to that after some time now look at this this oldest manuscript of the old testament ever to be discovered this was the oldest manuscript this is a scroll of the psalms that measures like 13 feet 13 feet long scroll when unrolled it contains 41 psalms from the last third of the book and it was written in hebrew and it dates from about ad 30 to 50 okay it is known as the elizabeth bashel sam scroll why it was so all these names come after the person who finds them they keep their name okay 
after the American philanthropist and designated. This is known as like 11 QPSA. This is the code which they give it for such a uh, thing. It was discovered in 1956 from the caves of Qumran. Look at the, by the way, this is not printed, okay? This is not uh, computer printed. This is all handwritten. Look at the, um, the organization. Look at the meticulous way of writing. Look at how it was preserved. And this is in a scroll, a leather scroll. This was written in leather scroll. Okay. Now, I'm showing you all these pictures so that, you know, you will get an idea about what is what. Okay. This is the oldest fragment, again, the Hebrew Bible, the oldest Hebrew Bible until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scroll. Now, the Dead Sea Scroll, I, you'll ask me, what is Dead Sea Scroll? It was found in 1947 in a cave of Bedouin. They found out that the entire manuscripts preserved, completely preserved and dated back to 2000 years back. Somebody put all the scriptures, the manuscripts, not the original. They hid those things under the cave. And a boy one day randomly, he was digging something and he found one paper roll like this. This is what he found. Okay. And when he gave it to Antique, they found out that this was the Ten Commandments written. This text is known as the Nash Papyrus and it dates back to 1st or the 2nd century BC. This is not AD. This is even before uh, the time of Jesus. Okay. It was discovered in Egypt in 1902. The scroll contains the Ten Commandments and the Shema. These are the words. It was purchased by in 1902 by W. L. Nash from the Egyptian antique dealer. <laughs> you see, this is just the Ten Commandments. All right. Let's move ahead. This is a leaf. Again, this is not printed. This is handwritten. This is a leaf from Codex Chirensis that dates to AD 895. It was copied by the famous scribe called Moses ben Asher at Tiberias near the Sea of Galilee. This leaf is a text of Zechariah 14 and the beginning of Malachi. Okay. All right. So I've shown you all the pictures and we will see now how these text is, how can we claim these texts are absolutely um, meticulous or there is no error. How can we trust this? Okay, so now I want you to, this is the major portion, don't, don't miss this. The principal manuscripts behind the Old Testament, okay? Now we all, when we, uh, when we ask this question, when we hear all this, we ask this question, from where did they copy all these things, right? Our English Bible, some people come and tell me, Pastor, uh, the King James Version is the original translation of the Bible. Okay. Uh, so all the modern translation Bibles are not the original translation. Or some people even ask me this question. Um, Pastor, do we have the original text? That is my new favorite word. In three vectors, plural vectors, you cannot make and Okay. Can I request you all if you are, I know some of you have different things to do at this point of time. Um, but if uh, it will be great if you can actually concentrate and, you know, even when you are offline, it will be nice. All right. Thank you. So some people come and ask me, Pastor, give me the original translation. I want to compare the nearest original translation. Actually speaking, if you ask me next time, anybody, Pastor, give me the original translation. I will tell you, go and read Codex Leningradiness, Leningradensis. Okay. This is the original first copy, which was copied. This is the 11th century AD manuscript. The oldest dated manuscript of the complete Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, okay? 
Now, some of these figures may definitely move you. Codex Leningradensis. The code word used is B19A or B19L. Is housed in the Russian Public Library in Leningrad. That's a name. It is that. That's why the name Leningradensis. Okay. It is a volume of 491 folios or leaves. And every folios have three columns per page. It was completed around AD 1010 in Cairo, Egypt. Okay. Now, it was copied from exemplars produced by famous Masoretic. Please note this word Masoretic. Scholar named Aharon ben Asher. I showed you the picture, previous picture. I showed you the previous picture. Okay. I'll show you that picture again. This is the picture. Okay. This was the handwritten copy finished around AD 1010 at Cairo. Okay. This picture, this is just a portion of that entire Bible. Zechariah 14 and the beginning of Malachi. Okay. It was copied by the person called Aharon ben Asher, who was part of a long line of scribes. Now, when I say scribes, this Masoretus, the word Masor, uh, Masoretus comes from the Hebrew word Masora, which means transmission of traditions. Okay. These Hebrew scholars were devoted to a meticulous preservation of the Bible and its proper pronunciation. How to pronounce? How to preserve the scribes were the people who were behind this. Okay. So from the line of that scribe, a person called Aharon ben Asher, he started the work somewhere around 895, finished the work around 1010 AD, and he finished the first. So this is the first complete Hebrew Bible the oldest Hebrew Bible that we have, just 11th century. This is like just 1,000 years back that we have the original Bible being written down from all the copies that we have, okay, close to all the copies that they have. This person collected it and meticulously wrote the first Hebrew Bible. So remember this name, Codex Leningradensis. From there, we have all the new, new translations coming up, okay? This is also known as a faithful representation of the text of the Hebrew Bible as when it was compared to the Dead Sea Scroll, Dead Sea Scroll, 1956, they found out in the cave of Bedouin. There were exceptional degree of agreements. That means it was compared almost 95% similar. And there were some here and there errors, which we call it as a scribal error in terms of like names, in terms of places, in terms of miles, like, you know, distance between so and so. Now it can reduce, like, for example, a thousand years back, the distance between um, this place to this place, point A to point B will be thousand miles. But today the distance could be like, uh, you know, 500 miles. So those errors except for those minor scribal errors, there were exceptional degree of agreements between when they compared that handwritten, um, handwritten uh, you know, manuscripts from this person called Aharon Ben Asher and the Dead Sea Scroll, when they compared it, it was a maze, striking exceptional degree of agreements. Okay, that was sad, fantastic. That was like, now this is, this is one of the leaf from the cortex Lenin gradensis. This is the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus, okay? Now you see this uh, footnotes in between those thing. Those footnotes are the calculation. So this person who wrote this handwritten, he even made sure that the exact words without an addition of one word and without subtraction of one, he exactly copied this thing. So that's a calculations in between and some of the 
um, you know, brain work which is working behind. Now, this is the leaf, one of the leaf from the codex. So if you ask me which is the original translation, well, this is now. Let me also add something. This is in a language which many people don't profess it today. And many people don't understand it. Okay. This is Hebrew, by the way. This language is Hebrew. Many people don't understand this because this was an ancient Hebrew uh, language. Today, the language is evolving. It is evolving and many translations come up to actually fit in that particular context uh, or particular place or, uh, okay, that language, how they use it. Okay. The Bible has been preserved and presented in a variety of ways throughout the history. The Bible was not delivered from heavens, nor from angels, but came from men who wrote the word of God, and it was God-breathed. Okay, the Bible has taken form in writing, printing, and code. Most of the ancient copies of the Bible were written in papyrus or vellum. Some of them were written in stone potteries, as we saw in that um, Numbers chapter 6. Okay, we saw that. Some were written in clay tablets. And now we have the Bible printed in different languages. Just imagine centuries back, this Bible hand. If you say that you have the Bible, that simply means that you were one of the richest royal family. Today, praise God that when the pastor says the grace of the Lord, please take Leviticus chapter 26. You can just take a mobile phone. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Yes, we are ready with the Bible. Yeah. But centuries back, this Bible was an expensive enterprise. Nobody, nobody can afford having the Bible because it was only, it can only be afforded by kingly or royal families. That's the reason this Bible was always, now we haven't, should always, we should be thankful to God that we have the Bible. And now the thing is, the difficult thing is not that we have the Bible. The difficult thing is that we have the time to read the Bible. How many of us, just, just imagine, centuries back, people used to crave just to get the glimpse of the Bible. Today, you have Bibles, Bible in your phone. You have translations. You can, if you want a Bible, you can just grab it anytime, any moment. How grateful we should be, not just grateful, how thankful that we have the Bible in our hands, but still people find it very difficult to carry a Bible. Yeah. Somebody said, if you, if you carry the Bible, the Bible will carry you. Yeah. Don't, don't tell me it's in the phone. In your phone, there are so many things. Yeah. In your phone, you have the movies, you have the um, stuff, which is official, which is private. You have a lot of stuff inside that. And then one part of it is a Bible. But Bible in a book is complete Bible. So the thing is, take the Bible if you have. Take the written Bible, take it to the church. Take the, uh, the, the, the online or maybe you know the e-book or e-Bible. That's okay. But preferably take a Bible with you to the church. This is just an encouragement to all of you. The Bible has been preserved and as evidence for its integrity than any other ancient book. Okay, Compared when the historians, not the Christian historians, the secular historians, when they compared the Bible, they came to a conclusion that Bible is what it says and its evidence for its integrity is high than any other books of the history. Now, after Alexander the Great followed his imperialistic intentions, this is around like 200 BC before Jesus, people adopt, started adopting Greek. Greek was like today, English is the main language. At that point of time, 2,200 years back, Greek was the major language and everybody was speaking in Greek because that was an official language in and around the world. Okay, And the Bible was first translated into Greek from this translation, which is known as the Septuagint. Now you ask me what is Septuagint? This is Septuagint. First translation of the Bible were made by the Jewish people who got settled in Egypt. 
because they didn't have their land. So they settled in Egypt and these Jewish people wanted their children to know what is the word of God. Okay. They wanted to know what is the word of God. So now I just want to read it out for, for you. According to Jewish tradition that is largely discounted, the translation was actually commissioned and, you know, ordered by the Egyptian ruler around 285 to 247 BC. This is like 285 years before Jesus. Okay. Um, Ptolemy II Philadelphus was his name. Okay. Now this story was told in the letter of Aristius, which is like a very old form of letter claims that 70 scribes worked on this translation. How many scribes? 70. Now, what do you mean by the word Septuagint? Septuagint simply means 70. Okay, why it is named as Septuagint? Because 70 scribes, they moved by the Holy Spirit, they came together and they said, let us copy the Hebrew scriptures to the Greek language. And that was the first translation ever made of the Bible, of the Hebrew Bible. Till that time, the Bible was not translated. Okay. But that was the time, the first time they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek after the Greek word for 70. The text Septuagint is preserved in nearly 2000 ancient Greek manuscripts. So this was also a manuscript. Okay. Coming back to my uh, scribe. Okay. In 1946, a Bedouin shepherd discovered a handful of ancient scrolls in the caves of Qumran. And a deeper search led to the DSS. What is DSS? Dead Sea Scrolls. That led to the DSS, that is the Dead Sea Scrolls. So when, when they compared this, it was almost like 95 percentage. Uh, okay, like, no, it was agreeing to 95 percent, no error, just some scribal errors. Now, let me just summarize how we got our Bible. This is taken from the Bible, which is called the Overview Bible. Okay. You can have this, uh, you can purchase this Bible and you will have all this. This particular picture is taken from the Overview Bible, which I have it. I just took the picture and, and I put it here. All right. This Bible is from Overview. You can, you can take this Bible. You will have a lot of diagrams and pictures of the thing okay let's let's summarize what how we have it today how we get the bible there is no specific place or day or time for the inception of what we know the bible instead the bible was written by 40 different authors over a span of 1500 years as god revealed his message to humankind and appointed different people to record that message the 66 book that comprised the collected and written word of god came to us by god's initiative guidance and grace who wrote them who wrote them and why okay these are the scriptures you can just take a screenshot and you will you can go through prophets or people chosen by god were called to deliver his message to his people new testament apostles or men directly associated with the apostles were inspired by god to write in order to address the needs of the specific individuals or churches okay how were they written? How was the Old Testament written? The Hebrew scribes meticulously copied the words of the Old Testament prophets onto scrolls in the Hebrew and the Aramaic language. Okay. How was the New Testament written? The Gospels began as oral tradition first that were eventually compelled, compiled and written. The individual writing of the New Testament were written on scrolls in Greek and then sent to intended individuals and churches across many regions all right so first it was oral tradition new testament was oral tradition then it was copied down how were they preserved the old testament how was they preserved the jewish scribes were meticulous when copying the manuscript they were very meticulous uh, today we have uh, certain quotes from uh, we say that i don't remember that exactly we say that it is scribal proof yeah, we say in some of the offices we use, it is scribal proof. That means there is no error. Okay, that this, this thing contains no error. 
How was the New Testament preserved? The writings became worn out as they were passed out from person to person and churches to churches, but they were recopied by hands many times. That's the reason we have like 23,769 copies of New Testament by the time of today. Okay. Now, the history. Come up to the, this page, the history book of the Bible, history book of Bible translation. As I told you, 250 BC, that is before Jesus, 250 years before Jesus, Septuagint was translated from the Hebrew and Aramaic. And the Hebrew Bible or the Tanakh, I told you last time what the Tanakh is. Tanakh is the, the Torah, the, uh, the Ketuvim, and the Navim. Okay, the Torah, Navim, and Ketuvim. And they take the first two words, it becomes Tanakh was translated into Greek by approximately 70 Jewish scholars. Okay. When they, when Greek, when Alexander conquered the world and he actually um, uh, made sure that everybody speaks Greek. So there was a need that, you know, Hebrew scriptures, now many people, the new generation did not know the scriptures. They did not know Hebrew. They did not know uh, what is Hebrew language or writing or speaking. So there was a need that, the language should be translated. So 70 people came together, the government at that point of time, the king said, okay, fine, you guys can do the thing and the king ought, uh, helped them with finance and stuff. And they translated around 250 BC. Around 400 AD, that is CA, uh, that is 400 years after the, uh, the coming of Jesus, the Vulgate, that means, the Septuagint, the Greek Bible, was translated into Latin Bible. Okay. The Greek Bible was translated into Latin Bible. And was the first Bible to include all the 66 books. And this became known as the Vulgate. Okay. Some of the churches, especially in Kerala, when you go, they read the Latin uh, Bible and they, if you ask them, they will say this is the oldest um, translation. Well, sometimes you know, Bible says you no, know, the the lack of knowledge, the beginning of all evil. The oldest translation was not Bulgarian; it was Septuagint. Okay, now seventh seventh century, that is close to six hundred and fifty A.D. Another translation came and it was translated from Latin Bible to the Anglo-Saxon language. Okay. This translation is known as the Venerable Bede. The Venerable Bede. This translation was translated from Vulgate to Anglo-Saxon language. All right. Now this this Anglo-Saxon Latin, this Latin Bible was considered as the, from the Roman. That, that's the thing which I want to bring it to attention is the Roman Catholic uh, churches uh, by that time, 7th century and now. It was, it became so corrupted. It became so, um, you know, political that they did not want anybody to translate the Bible. So anybody who translates the Latin Bible was condemned or persecuted for, uh, for treason. Okay, That means it was considered as offense if you translate the Bible. So it was said, uh, did anybody say anything? Did anybody ask any question or should I go forward? Okay, so I may go forward. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, so the, they, they, they said that you know, nobody should translate the Bible. So it was like um, considered as an offense to to translate the Bible in any language. Okay, it was considered as a big offense to translate the Bible. And it was very surprising that those times the priest would read from the Latin Bible, they will add so many things and they will 
they will say that you know this is what the word of god and there were so many lies for example so many traditions which started coming like the uh, tradition of um, um, you know the soul being uh, transferred to heaven or we call it as the purgatory uh, or the if you give a lot of money uh, you know your souls will directly go to heaven and even the the venerating of the saints like they venerated all this and they make so many things uh, in the name of certain saints all these things started coming in during the time after 7th century and the translation was almost halted so if you if i if you see the previous slide which i showed you very few different languages were translated during this time so after the anglo saxon translation there was like for the next 700 800 years there was no translation of the bible October 6 was a time, okay, where a man of God was actually um, uh, burned at stake, okay. For what? His crime was simple. He translated the Bible in, into English, okay. He translated the Bible into English. So what was, who was this man? He was William Tyndale. Now, if any one of you doesn't know this person, you should better know this person. You know why? Because this man's sacrifice led to the uh, to the translation of the Bible. He was actually burned at stake in October 6, um, 1536. William Tyndale was burnt alive for translating the Bible into English. Okay, this is the day that, you know, it was a black history. Who burnt this man? It was not the, the, the outsiders, it was not, it was the Christians themselves. They burnt this man because he translated the Bible in English. Okay, so around 1380 to 1384, John Wycliffe was the first to translate the Bible from Latin into English. Okay, his Bible translation was known as Wycliffe Bible. So this was, when this was done, they brought this rule. No translation of the Bible because that is all the translation is not right and it is sinful. It is uh, when you translate the Bible, we lost our original content and intent and stuff like that. William Tyndale thought, no, I will, I will translate. So he translated, he produced the first English translation of the original language. And he was the first English New Testament to be printed on the press. So when he did that in 1536, that means just 11 years after, for this reason that he translated the Bible, he was burnt at stake with many priests, fathers, officials, kings, attesting that this man deserves to die. All right, so 1525 was the first English translated in the press. 1611, King James of England created what became known as the King James Version of the Bible. That was the first English translation. Now, this language, if you read that, that King James Version, you'll be surprised that this version was actually very, it is, though it is called as an English, but if you read that Bible, it will be surprising that you will understand, you will not understand 80% of what was written in this. Because at that point of time, the English language was a mixture of Latin and Anglo-Saxon. So as the language evolved, today the English, many people speak in many languages, including England and US. Those people will also not understand this King James Version of the Bible. 80% of they will not understand it because the language was completely, completely different. All right. So... That's a King James Version 2000. By, by now, we have a lot of translation um, based on our need, based on some of the things, based on um, like, you know, uh, certain language preferences, certain language things. We have a lot of translations of the Bible. Uh, some people prefer KJP translation. Absolutely nothing wrong in that if you can understand that language some people prefer niv languages the fact of the matter is this if the holy spirit can preserve 
the scriptures for the last so many years, close to 3,000 years, if the Holy Spirit can move the authors to write the scriptures. And for the last 2,000 years, if he can preserve the scriptures, why are we worried that somebody corrupted the word? Why are we worried that, you know, this is not the original translation? Eventually, it is the Holy Spirit who convicts the person. It is not a person or a writing or a, or a individual. It is the Holy Spirit who convicts the person. If the Holy Spirit had to change a person's heart, he doesn't have to read the entire scripture to you. He just have to take one word off the scripture and let that thing into your heart. You will be transformed. <laughs> So forget about, you know, do we have, why we don't have the uh, original manuscript, we don't have the original writing, so how can we believe this is true? We are not here to believe whether the Bible is true or not. We are to hear, here to believe whether the word of God speaks to us even today. So the question is whether you believe what the Holy Spirit tells you. And now let me just tell you, if the Holy Spirit convicts you and he takes a word of the scripture, it may be a word. It can be a verse. It can be a passage. It can be a book. When he reveals that thing to you in a fresh way, you can just kneel down, lift up your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. It has happened to me. Certain times, I just kneel down and say, what a revelation, Lord. This was never done before. This was so powerful. I never thought this could mean this. And that's the Holy Spirit. You know who wrote this scripture? It was the Holy Spirit who wrote this scripture. So who should ignite your, ignite your mind? The Holy Spirit should ignite your mind. Next time when you want, you know, some people uh, quote this verse, you know, in the Old Testament, if anybody adds or subtracts to the word of God, he is punishable. That is said in a different context. Go back home and read what the context was. It doesn't mean that, you know, if we translate the Bible and if we add a single word, it, it becomes sinful. No, that is not what it, that means that if you add something to fit like the Pharisees who added to the scripture and subtract it from the scripture, okay, like the Pharisees. If you do like that, yes, you are punishable by offense, okay? But if you are actually translating and instead of like Hebrew, you will see three words in English, you will see seven words. It doesn't change anything. It is not sin. And you can actually quote the scripture and the Holy Spirit is the one who actually illuminates your mind or heart to see the, the glory. So, so let me just conclude this thing by saying if the Holy Spirit can preserve, by the, by the way, if the Holy Spirit can write or another way, if he can breathe the scriptures through 40 authors and throughout the century, if he can preserve the scriptures, and now in 20, 21st century, we are just finding things to prove whether the scripture is right or wrong. And all the findings that we are doing, you'll be surprised to know, those findings are just telling us that the scripture is true. Okay? Discoveries of, discoveries of the ancient test continue to be made. Caves near the Dead Sea in Israel, storerooms in monasteries, excavations in Egypt have all turned up manuscripts in the recent years. Perhaps one of the most surprising place scholars have found Bible manuscripts in recent years have been in libraries and museums. Some of these museums contain boxes of unclassified pieces of ancient manuscripts. Okay, this is not what uh, that movie, uh, what is that movie said, some code there. This is not those things. Those are all exaggerations. Okay that required this unclassified pieces of ancient manuscript require enormous time and expertise to sort through and identify. And those things have been done and preserved 
for just to prove whether whatever we have in the Bible is 99 percentage, 99 percentage true. I want to conclude by saying the Bible which you have it in your hand. Maybe let me just do this this thing for you. Okay, then maybe just do this thing for you. If you if you are sitting with me, take your Bible like this. Take your Bible like this, all of you. Okay, and just say this. Thank you, Lord, for this Bible. Thank you, Lord, for writing this scripture. Thank you, Lord, for preserving this scripture. And thank you, Lord, for speaking to us even today through the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. So that's all for uh, today's class. Next year, next uh, class, we will see about how can we trust this Bible is true? How can we know certain things, what was copied was actually right? And some of the questions which you asked in the previous classes also would be addressed in the next um, session. Hopefully, I will see how I can take it up. Today, we had a lot of technical words, some of the Greek words or some of the Latin words used or some of the you know, some manuscripts, pictures and all. Uh, don't worry, you don't have to remember all those things. This is just for your reference. Just to tell you that this has been the work of the Holy Spirit throughout the centuries to preserve the scriptures. Okay. So if there is any questions at this point of time, or if there is any, uh, if you want to add a, a comment, or if you want to say a word, take this time, I request the media team to unmute people so that uh, they can speak it up. So please speak, don't hesitate, over to you. Uh, praise the Lord, Pastor, I have a query. 